Is this seat taken? You know, because of our music ministry, for the last 12 years or so, Karen and I have been going to different churches during the summer months. We've noticed that when attending an unfamiliar church, if we select a seat in the first few rows, we are never in danger of taking somebody's pew. I don't know why churchgoers tend to fill the back half of the sanctuary, but it seems to be a universal phenomenon. Do you think it could have anything to do with the final verse of last week's gospel lesson? You remember it, right? It was Mark 10, verse 31, which was a repetition of Matthew 19, 30, and Matthew 20, 16. The last will be first, and the first will be last. So do we take the back seats in an effort to humble ourselves in the back of the church so we can get the good seats in heaven? No, I don't think so. I think it's because the back seats are closer to the exit. Well, as we read in today's gospel lesson, James and John are trying to climb the ladder to glory. They are looking forward to getting the best seats in the kingdom of God. Not in the back, not in the front, but right there beside Jesus. Pretty gutsy, wasn't it? But before we consider their request, let's look at the events leading up to this point. If you were here last Sunday, you will remember that last week was the story of the rich man who asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He confirmed to Jesus that he had obeyed the Ten Commandments throughout his entire life. You and I should recognize that hidden in this story, Jesus was affirming the Mosaic moral law that was given to Moses by God at Mount Sinai, it's still in force in the New Covenant. Not only that, but the lesson of the Exodus to trust and rely on God completely and to be a member of the community of believers is also required. In other words, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus told the rich man, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. This, of course, was too hard for the rich man. Then what happened? That's right. The rock. Peter spoke up. Hey! What's the matter with us, huh? What are we, chopped liver? Well, Jesus explained to anybody, anybody, not just disciples, but anybody who gives up everything to follow him will have eternal life. And the first will be last, and the last will be first. Which means all believers will share equally in the blessings of heaven. By the grace of God, the thief on the cross will enjoy the full blessings of heaven, just as those who have labored their full lives for Christ. As we get back to today's gospel, we should be aware that just before this encounter, with James and John, Jesus revealed for the third time that he would soon be condemned to death. This revelation was in great detail, saying that he would be mocked, flogged, 
and crucified and on the third day on the third day will be raised to life with that in mind as I said before it was really really kind of gutsy that John and James the sons of Zebedee would make such a bold request as give us the best seats in heaven remember Jesus also called them the sons of thunder so he probably wasn't shocked by their brash boldness there's something else interesting about this encounter in Matthew's account he tells us that Salome the mother of John and James was there also why would she be mentioned in Matthew's account but not Mark's I can't say for sure but we should remember that Mark wasn't present when this conversation took place but Matthew was Mark is actually reporting on Peter's memoirs so maybe Peter thought that Salome's role was not important enough to mention after all she didn't ask for consideration in heaven for herself just her sons come to think of it why was mom there at all the sons of, of thunder are big boys they don't need mama tagging along do they well maybe they did remember in the accounts of the crucifixion in Matthew 27 tells us there were women there it says ministering to him among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee why do you suppose the mother of James and John were there John himself solves the puzzle in the Gospel of John chapter 19 verse 25 where he reports that among the women was Jesus mother's sister Salome was Jesus aunt and James and John were Jesus cousins they were playing the family card and isn't it just like family to ask like this teacher they said we want you to do for us whatever we ask oh yeah and by the way would you sign a blank check while you're at it really it's not wise to make open-ended promises remember when Herod Antipas promised his stepdaughter anything up to half his kingdom and that wound up with John the Baptist's head on a platter it's really not wise to make open promises but of course Jesus wasn't falling for it he says what do you want me to do for you he asked they replied let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory now because of the way this was written in the original Greek we know this was not a simple request this was not a hey may I please kind of request the Greek words did hina translate best as grant that in the imperative mood it's an imperative statement which means it expresses a command to perform a certain action by the order and authority of the one commanding by what authority the family card so does Jesus rebuke them it doesn't seem like it he responds calmly you don't know what you are asking Jesus says can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with we know immediately that he is speaking about the cup that he will soon ask to be passed from him as he prays in Gethsemane 
The baptism is figurative, indicating an immersion into the suffering and persecutions that Jesus was subject to. So naturally, they perhaps naively said, Sure, we can. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. James didn't have to wait long, about 11 years. He was the first of the disciples to be martyred. He was killed by the sword in A.D. 44. John, on the other hand, was the only disciple to avoid martyrdom. However, he did not in the least avoid persecution. He lived his final years in exile on the island of Patmos. Jesus went on to say, But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. It is only by the sovereign will of God that heavenly honors are dispensed. Family ties just don't cut it. Now that the sons of thunder are put in their place, it's time for the rest of the disciples to get indignant about James and John trying to jump to the front of the line. In fact, they had no right to be indignant. After all, this isn't the first time the subject came up. Back on the road to Capernaum, they argued about who was the greatest. And guess what? It was, wasn't to be the last time either. Even at the Last Supper, as told in Luke 22, verse 24, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be considered the greatest. The story should impress on you just how very, very human the disciples were. We know from Matthew 19, 28 that Jesus had already told them that they would sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Despite this lofty promise, they were still clamoring to climb higher up the glorified ladder than their companions. That's when Jesus turned their assumptions and the virtual ladder to glorification upside down. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. So, if you want to put a bunch of devout Jewish believers in their place, compare them to Gentile government officials. Come to think about it, that would be quite an insult today, too wouldn't it? So he said, that's not the way it's supposed to be in a church. We don't lord our authority over one another. Greatness doesn't come by climbing up the ladder. The greatness that leads to sanctification and glorification comes by climbing down the ladder. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. In the most extreme example of upside down glory, Jesus climbed down the ladder. Jesus left his position of glory and descended to become human. And not only that, but to be despised, ridiculed, mocked, flogged, and crucified. And in the following sentence, the, the last sentence in our gospel lesson, he makes it clear that it is not only to keep his promise of salvation for believers, but also to explain, explain how he expects us 
to live our lives. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen.